So this guy walks into a bar. He's with his son, who has just passed the rite of passage to drinking age. So he takes, walks his son into the bar, it's kind of crowded, goes up to the bar, gets two pints of beer, goes back to his son, gives him, a, gives him the beer, clinks glasses, and he says, son, you're a really good guy. I'm, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud that you're my son. And they both take a swig of the beer, and at that moment, three young ladies go walking by. And the father smiles, natural thing for this man to do. And one of them smiles back, and he watches as they go walking by, and he looks at his son, and his son is really checking them out. So he goes, hey, buddy, checking them out too, huh? Which one do you like the most? And he said, the one on the left, the one that smiled at you. And he goes, yeah, you got good taste, son. You got good taste. And he goes, yeah, but dad, come on. She's out of my league. And the father says, no one is out of your league unless you believe it. Don't ever believe that anyone is out of your league or else they will be. It's not the one you want to sleep with. It's the one you want to wake up with. And when you see her, she's not out of your league. And it's the same in a sale. It's the same in a sale when we're prospecting, when we're at a networking event and there's a CEO who gives a great talk and something triggers and you say, I can help them. And then after the talk, you say, ah, oh, but he's a CEO of a mid-sized co- oh, No, 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 I, 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 can't, I can't talk to him. These are self-limiting beliefs. These are self-limiting beliefs. When you pick up the phone and you call that potential client, call the ones who you want to go into the office for on Monday morning, the one you want to wake up with. These are your ideal clients. And if you think, well, they're out of my league, then you will always have clients who aren't ideal. No one is out of your league. Take that deep breath and approach the CEO. Make those phone calls. There's a lot of tactics and emotions behind that, but don't limit yourself. Go for the ones that you want to wake up with. So about a year later, family barbecue, The son comes to the barbecue with his first girlfriend, and she is drop-dead gorgeous. And her personality is like sunshine in the spring. So after about a half hour, he takes his son aside, and he goes, dude, she's out of George Clooney's league. And the son says, yeah, but she's not out of mine. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Curious Courses. A sale is a love affair. Uh, We're going to see all of these parallels of a sale is a love affair. And in my book, there is a lot of human sexuality, human emotion, romance, spirituality, psychology, and a lot of caveman theory. And we also cut through a lot of pride. Sales is like sex. Everyone thinks they do it well. This is so true. It was spring 2011. I had been engaged as a conference speaker. And one of the primary speakers, it was in Poland, in fact. And uh, about a month before the conference, I had a conversation with the editor of the magazine that was sponsoring the the conference. And the uh, editor, a woman, says to me, uh, you know, what are some of the big hurdles in sales training? What are some of the big points of resistance? And I say, well, that's easy. Sales is like sex. Everyone thinks they do it well. And there was a pause, and I went, oh, shit. (laughs) Uh, I think I may have just blown the speaking gig. And a moment later, she burst out laughing, and she said, sorry, sorry, I just had to get that down. That's brilliant. I said, well, well, thank you. Um, and and it's, it's so true when you give sales training. The, I was giving one sales training early on when I first started doing it. One of our big clients, we had five divisions go through three days each. And the second or third division, first day, Claudia is in the workshop and she's deputy director of the division had been there for about six or eight months, and she sold herself on how well she can bring in new clients. 
She had actually only brought in one client, and that was a small deal from, an existing, from her previous agency when she, when she moved over. And throughout the morning session, Claudia is sitting there going, ah, everybody knows this. I read that years ago. I said, oh, cool. I could, you know, as a sales trainer, you don't need these people in your workshops, but it's reality. You get them. Uh, but also, as a, as a certified trainer, uh, you know how to neutralize them. So the first uh, role play, I don't do role plays with two people in the front of the room. I kind of break everybody into their tables so that four or five people are watching too. And so over at Claudia's table, I make sure that she's the role play salesperson. And afterwards, after the debrief, her table really crucified her for not using any of the tactics that we had talked about in the morning to which she was like, eh, everybody knows this. And it's kind of like, yeah, you know, everybody knows great sex, but do you do it, okay? Yeah, risque topic, risque topic. Sales is like sex, everybody thinks they do it well. Okay. So as the table started saying, well, Claudia, you didn't ask enough questions. Um, you didn't open uh, to take my breath away. Uh, and she's like, you know what? I, I've got so much work. I don't need to be here for two more days. And she slammed her notes and she walked out of the room. Guess what the conversation was about at the next coffee break? Okay. How poor of a salesperson she was. Guess what some of the other people were saying? She was probably bad in bed too. Okay, but I won't go there. But I won't go there. But the true master is an eternal student. This is the last chapter of my first book. Keep an open mind. The minute you say, I know that, you are in second place at best. The true masters are always learning. They're always eager to learn. And therefore, they will learn. But the minute you say, hey, I, I, I'm the man, I'm the one, I got this, you're probably not going to do it that well. So stay sensitive, stay loving to yourself, your imperfections, I can do better, I can learn, and to your customer, and to your partner if you wish as well. So, a quick question, how many of you think that there may be some things, I won't talk about sex, uh, that there are some things in your sales cycle that you might not be doing well. I want to see all your hands. I want to see all your hands. And I'm the first one to raise it. I once left a meeting on Fifth Avenue in New York, and as I was walking down the street, I said, shit, I'm not going to get the deal. I'm not going to get the deal. I know I blew it. And sure enough, the next day I get a phone. I was going to call them late the next day. The next morning, the HR guy who was sitting next to the CEO in the meeting said, hey, Jack, thanks for coming by. Real good. Look, we're going to think about this. It probably won't be a quick decision. But at the opening of the meeting, it was they had some things they wanted to take. And I basically took that as a no, and I knew why. I won't go into it now. We don't have time. But I'm always learning, too. And I'm a pretty good salesperson. I think I'm an excellent trainer and an excellent coach, but I know that in every sale there are things I can do better, and you must. So when you walk out, for example, when you're on the tram going back to your office, your home, to the airport, whatever, one question I want you to ask, if it's a first meeting with a potential client, who did more of the talking, you or the client? The pro if it's you, no, okay? There are reasons for this, okay? So how might you not be doing things well? Love yourself, keep an open heart to your imperfections, and really say, I'm not doing this well. I, God, I spoke too much in that. The first meeting, I spoke 70% of the time. I was nervous. I was trying to impress them. You know, the guy at the end of the bar with his Rolex watch who really doesn't listen to you much, but he's trying to impress you. He smiles and a white little ding comes off of his teeth. And you go, yeah, he's not my type. He, talk, he doesn't know anything about me. So listen and listen to yourself. Okay. Women need a reason to have sex. Men just need a place. 
Okay. This has been, uh, Billy Crystal has said this, doctor, whatever his name has said it. It's actually a French poet who is recorded as saying it for the first time. This is the most politically incorrect chapter in my book. When I wrote it, I was going, oh man, I'm going to get killed for this when this is published. No, I got to dilute this. And I said, no, I really believe this. If I were a psychologist, Writing some of these things, I would say it's psychology, it's science, it's biology, and it's... And then I thought, well, this is based on psychology. This is based on human sexuality and, you know, I mean, women, men, we have different hardware. So we have different software running the machines. I want women to be CEOs. I want 50-50, but you are different from us, and we're different from you. So let's accept it. So for this chapter, it's women are more intuitive. Women listen better. Okay? Women have a thousand reasons not to have sex with a guy for the first time until they do. Then they have a thousand reasons to justify it that they did the right thing. And it is the same in a sale, especially B2B. You're selling to somebody, they have all these risk things popping up. Boop, 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 yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Oh, I've got, I've got management, I've got other project leaders, I've got, to, I've got to get some other decisions. You know, they've got the family, they've got, okay, they have a thousand reasons. And so do the customers. They have a thousand reasons not to do a deal. Okay. Ron Lewis and David Copeland wrote this in their book, and they have a lot of scientific research to, to, you know, and how to succeed with women. Yes, I read these books. I also read women's books and some of the things you don't do well. Okay. This is, was part, man, it was great researching this book. I allowed myself to go to events and talk about books that I've read on pickup artists, on connection, on long-term relationships. It was, just, it was like my license. I could do this. And I was reading books on pickup artists and how to be successful in relationships, not just how to start them. And a thousand reasons to justify not doing a deal until they do. This is what customers are up against. And as a salesperson, you have to deal with it. We were talking about this on the way in. They've got, I'm, I'm talking to them about something and they ask a question a little bit different than what I want to talk about. You got to deal with that. You're a woman, okay? Understand that they're the woman now and you're the man. And if you want to really go deep with them, you got to say, uh-huh, yeah, baby, talk to me. Let's go there for a while. And when we do, I'll try to get the conversation back there. But you know what you'll find out? You might find out by going there, you'll get the deal and sticking with, I want to go here, I want to go here, I want to go here, they're going to say, yeah, sure, call me. But they won't answer. Customers have a thousand reasons not to do a deal, okay? Customers, men, or some women need a reason to have sex, men just need a place. Customers need a reason to do a deal. Salesperson just needs a place. These are the parallels. So a young woman is standing on a train platform. It's Earl's Court Station in London, if anyone's ever been there. The trains are just coming in and going out and coming in and going out. There's like four or six platforms. It's just noisy and trains are coming in. So you may be on a platform with someone else who's going to a different direction because there are, plan there are trains coming in two minutes after you. And she feels somebody looking at her. And she looks, and it's a really cute guy. And he looks away. And then he looks back, and she looks away. And this goes on for, they look away, they look away, they look away. And a train pulls up to the station, the doors open, he gets on. The doors close, he sits down at a seat, and as the train pulls away, they both look at each other through the window and go, <gasps> and the train pulls away. Where was she the next day at the same time? Earl's Court Station platform too. Okay. Then she thought, when well, he wasn't there. So then she thought, Wednesdays. So where was she for the next two or three Wednesdays at 4.30 p.m.? Earl's Court Station, what platform? Thank you. But he was gone. He was gone forever. She used to work for me.
And she said, oh, Jack, why didn't he say something? And I looked at her. She goes, I know. I can only control myself. I should have said something to him. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, you should have said something to him. Regret is more painful than rejection. Rejection is a human, fear of rejection, fear, and rejection is a human emotion. Emotions are instantaneous. Feelings and thoughts, they linger. We, we may have an emotional triggering event and then we think about it for months. Those are feelings and emotions mixed with thought. Okay? Regret is painful. Rejection is painful. The difference between them is that rejection is acute. It's very short term. But we fear rejection from caveman times because if we are rejected, like public speaking, we get out there, we go, ah, we're okay, and they go, ah, out. But if you succeed at it, you'll become a leader. We fear rejection because being ostracized from the tribe, being thrown out of the tribe, the mountain in the winter is a pretty cool place cruel place to live alone. We don't want to be rejected by the tribe. It could mean survival or not. So we fear rejection. It's programmed in us. But if you think about it, you approach somebody on a platform, hey baby, bad job. Hey, yeah, do you, yeah, you look pretty interesting. Tell me about it. Okay. And they go, yeah, not happening. And you go, ah, or you go, hey, Cool, just have a nice day. Did somebody go, is there blood on the floor? You've just been rejected. It's 2016, you've just been rejected. You're not being thrown out of the tribe. Somebody has just said, nah, it's not happening. Cool, okay, have a nice day, okay? It is programmed in us, but if you, the rational mind says, okay, I said hello, didn't happen. Risk reward, hey, one out of ten, it happens, or more often. But regret lingers. The girl who worked for me, for weeks she was thinking about that. For weeks she was thinking about that. So take the risk. And if you get rejected, so what? If it's somebody of the opposite sex or the same sex, it's somebody you're, you're attracted to, and you get rejected, Fine, but guess what? You probably made their day, even if they're already in another relationship, even if it's a surprise. Okay, you probably made their day. And if you keep doing it, you'll probably be successful. And it's the same in sales. Make those cold calls. If you can turn a cold call into a warm call, there are tactics for that. But be risky, because if you say, no, I think I'll work on my social media strategy. I want inbound marketing. Sure, but even when you get inbound marketing, you gotta say, hey, there's some point I gotta pick up the phone and say, hey, I saw you were on my website. But if you're gonna like send them an email or something, the telephone is your friend, face-to-face -face is your friend. Meeting somebody in an event, they're your friend. If you're not doing it, don't, you know, Paulo Coelho, I had this goal and I knew that the universe would conspire to help me. Bullshit in sales. Wait for the universe to, okay, no, no, you gotta conspire to help the universe to help you. You just don't say, I woke up today and I wanna be a trainer and the universe is gonna conspire to help me, no. You want, to get, you, want consp you want conspiracy? Conspire yourself. Do these things. Far better to be rejected than not. Susan Miller Hines is a dating coach. She's in my book. She used to be a, there's a chapter, this chapter, she's very much in it. She used to be a salesperson. And she said, you know, when it comes to dating and when it comes to sales, take those risks. And when you get rejected, Celebrate having the courage to do it. So how many of you aren't making cold calls? How many of you, yeah, thank you for being honest. You gotta make cold calls. And try to turn them into warm calls. Got a little trick for you. Make, call people you know. Okay, so if you're gonna do Wednesday afternoons, be free. Call a couple people, hey, how's it? I haven't talked to you in a year, how you doing? Hey, this is my space, this is not, I need work. You know anybody who needs me? No. This is what I'm doing. You know anybody who needs help in this area? 
and then get into a conversation about value add and needs and things like that, and maybe you'll get, hey, Chris Renner just said I should call you. That's a warm call when you have, but have these little conversations with people you know, then make the calls from the person you met at the event on Sunday, or the person who you just read about, they've got needs in your area, call them. Call them. The more you do it, the easier it will be. Okay? So, early in a sale, now, you know, I know these are workshops, and I, when I've got, if I, you give me a day, you're going to be doing a lot of exercises. You give me three days, you're going to be doing a lot of exercises. You give me 45 minutes, I want to give you information. We could sit here spending 20 minutes exchanging cards, and, okay, that's just not me. Okay? I want to give you a lot of information. Interrupt at any time. I know I kind of got ahead of steam and it's hard to interrupt me. Come up afterwards or we can talk later. But I'm here to give you info, okay? Early in a sale, it's incumbent upon you to take my breath away. Yes, that's right. Take my breath away. Attraction is an emotion. Curiosity is an emotion. We don't realize it when our mouth is hanging open and we're going, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad these people came in today. Okay? He yeah, looks like a fool. He's got his mouth open, but he might buy from me. Okay? Darling, ever since that guy walked in here, you haven't been paying attention. You know, it's like, yeah, and your mouth is hanging open, is it? Okay? You don't realize your human messages when you are attracted, when you are curious. Curiosity is an emotion. They're not feelings. It's ah, uh, ah. Uh. So it's your job as a salesperson early on in the sale. This is what marketing is. Marketing draws us into the funnel. Oh, I think I'll click on that. Oh, I'll investigate more. You know, if you had a camera of yourself as you go, oh, I'm going to click. Ah, that. Hey, this is cool. You're curious. Curious courses. You're attracted. Okay. This is really important. But do it quickly and try then to do other things, which I'll show you in the next slide, okay? You might lose a deal later, but very early in a deal, it's emotional for the buyer. We need them. We got a problem we need to solve. We can hit our numbers. I can, I can fulfill my happiness. Ah, oh, I'm in, look at that hot chick over there, dude. Look, I gotta go, man. Yeah, well, you know, uh, zip up your fly before you do, dude, because, okay, all right, man, I'm in. This is what you want, the, this is where you want the customer to be early. You want them going, good idea for bringing these people in. You need to say something. Lion jumps out of the brush looks at you and goes to lunch. You don't say, you think we should refinance the house? Huh? Well, let me text message the Asian office to see how sales are. You got one problem. You have one problem. You're emotionally in this problem. We got to deal with it. That works for fear, it works for hope. Fear and hope are the two biggest drivers of human emotion, I believe. The two biggest drivers of human emotion are fear, Run, fight, deal with it, hope, maybe. Okay. And this is where you want your clients to be early in the sale. You get face to face. Online, this is where, you, this is where you're gonna pull them into your funnel. In, uh, in, in face to face, if they go, now, and I'll come to it in a second. You know, if they start with questions, I'm in, baby. Cool, I didn't have to open. But when they say, Jack, what have you got for us today? Well, why did you bring him in here? Tell us, Jack. I need to say something. And I normally start in one of three areas. Uh, what I do and why it's so valuable, okay. Client success stories, past clients, their successes. And then I go, do you have problems in this area? Do you have, ideas? okay. So tell them a quick little story where they go, he did that for them? And I go, do, are you guys up against it here? Well, as a matter of fact, we are. Bang! I've triggered them with something emotional. We had a client who was in a similar space as you. They dealt with us and, oh, really? Attraction is an emotion. I'm interested, tell us more. Well, before I do, let me ask you a couple of questions. Whatever you want, man, I'm in. It's where you want to get them, emotionally in. Then you can play, you can pull the strings. Talk about leadership, push versus pull. 
Don't push a customer through your sale. Pull them through their purchase. You want to get money out of somebody. You want to become a part of their lives and add value and send them invoices. They are meeting you for the first time. One of the biggest leadership tasks is selling. Pull them through their purchase. Don't push them through your sale. This is love. This is customer focus. Okay? So, got to grab early. Grab their attention. Presentation skills. Tell a story. Interesting fact. Get them in. Okay? Grab their attention. Then move on. But grab their attention. Even Shakespeare said, who has loved? Who has not loved at first sight? Shakespeare. So what is your story? How do you open? Anyone want to jump in here for somebody? Do you have an opening? Somebody says, thanks for coming by. What have you got for me? I'm going to go back to that. Thanks for coming by. What have you got for me? If no one wants to answer that, it's putting yourself. Please. I'm sorry? You tell your story. Good. How, how long is it? No. Can't be two story. Uh, yeah. And I would say, tell a previous customer's story. I do workshops in storytelling as well. I do storytelling in business. And right out of literature, right out of the hero's journey, and it's human and it works in sales. You are not the hero. Your customers are the heroes. Heroes are not, here he is to save the day, another cat out of another tree. No, heroes struggle. They've got big pro Harry Potter, hero, mentor, Dumbledore, you're Dumbledore. Okay, just give the customer enough information to go, yeah, I can do it. If, if Dumbledore would have told Harry day one what he was up against, Harry would have said, nope, I'm going back to my normal life. I wanted to be a normal person anyway, and I got this to deal with. Help these people be normal people. Mentor them. But tell a previous customer's story. Very effective. We worked with them. They had this problem. They were up against it. We dealt with their problem this way, and these were the results. Oh, yeah? You did that for them? Yeah. Are you guys up against something similar? Okay. Enough about me. Let's talk about you. We did this, or... It, we understand that in your industry, many people are, or in your life for the coach, okay? I, so tell a testimonial from a previous client, a success story from a previous climate, client, or your value add. This is what we do and this is how we do it, okay? Then move the conversation away from you and toward them. That whole opening and the first, this is halfway through my presentation probably and I'm not even looking at the watch, okay? When it comes to really being face-to-face -face with a client, that should be co as compressed as you get. I say that B2B meetings, business-to-business -business meetings, okay, I walk in the front door, okay, oh, Mr. Vincent, they're on the third floor waiting for you. And I get on the third floor, okay, and I'm in the lift, do -do 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 -do. lift door opens, you're in their culture, you're in their business day, they could have just had bad news from North America, they could, they, or they could be, it's your day, their day, their office usually, uh, and they're the buyer, they're the ones going through. So you don't know, when those doors open, you don't know what you got. And it could be anything in between, but here are the two extremes. Uh, Mr. Vincent, follow me. And I'm trying to make small talk, and they're like, no, 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 this is a culture of fear. I don't want to be caught talking to somebody we may not buy from. And you're like, okay, well, this is good. Yeah, okay, well, I got to deal with it. I could say, this place sucks already. I'm going home. I could say that. Or I could say, well, I'm here. So you go in and you sit down, and three minutes later, three dark suits walk in, and they go, what have you got for us, Mr. Vincent? I have to open and make it catchy and all of that, okay? Or they walk, the lift opens and there's my contact with his or her boss and the boss says, hey Jack, thanks for coming in today. The reason we took the meeting is, oh, I love it. The client is talking. I don't want to talk about me. Yeah, I do, I do. That's like a little secret, I do. But when I'm in a sale, I certainly don't. 
I want the client talking about them. The more they talk about them in the first meeting, the more they are trusting me. And when that lift door opens, for some reason, and they say, the reason we took the meeting is, they may be trusting me for they've been on my website, they've heard about me, they've done some research on me. God, it's great, it must be good research, okay? Or they're so up against it that I'm the lucky person in the door today and they're saying, we need a solution and you're here and here's what we're up against. But I, I can tell you, I love that. When I have to open, I open, I say my success story, and then I go, are you guys up against it in a similar, what are you guys up against? And you can, you know, if it's big corporate, you know, ties up to their neck, uh, you may say, what challenges are you facing? If it's, you know, the Silicon Valley startup, you may say, what's keeping you up at night? Tailor these words to your clients and your lifestyle and your own brand, but Early in a sale, you want to get away from you talking about yourself and get them talking about, early in a sale, you want them talking about their challenges. What's keeping you up at night? How are the salespeople do, dealing? And when they answer it, oh, these are our challenge. I got a solution. Yeah, you're the horny guy at the end of the bar. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of lonely in Zurich when I first moved in here. Let's go sleep together. I mean, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work, okay? Hey, you know, me too, I'm gonna, well, how long have you been living here? When they answer the question, well, yeah, are your salespeople feeling the same? What are the implications of that? Go deeper, go deeper, and listen, baby, it's about love. Show me, as a buyer, show me the love, listen to me, and be my coach. In, send me an invoice and I'll become your coach. No, become the coach in the sales process. Trusted advisor? These are who we buy from. They ask you a question. Hire me and I'll tell you. Now, obviously, you're not going to give them hours of sales calls in which they're picking you. At some point, it's natural. But early in a sale, be consultative, answer questions thoroughly, and lead them through the purchase. Listen to them. The killer app in selling is listening. How do you listen? The killer app in engagement, asking great questions. Now, not just any question at any time, I won't go into it now, but this is part of my sales training. What questions are you asking when things pop up? How are you handling objections? When they're halfway through the sale, are you still asking the same kind of questions that you were asking after your catchy opening? Not good, because as you pull them, the, the emotional needs change, and the mental, and the mental needs. You gotta be asking them the right questions at the right time. And the more they talk, the more they're trusting you, okay? The more they're feeling comfortable with themselves to buy from you. You are not there to sell. You are there to help them buy from you. Do not be the pushy salesperson. Be the loving consultant. How much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes? Yeah, good. Uh, a friend of mine is is, was, uh, was dating a divorced mother. He was really in. He, he was, this, I dig her. And they've been going on for four or five months and they're out at dinner at one night. And he says to her, as you know, dessert is being served and they're finishing their glass of wine and their, the, the bottle of wine, he says to her, how do you think your kids would feel about you seeing another man, about, about, you, seeing, about you seeing somebody? And with that, the woman just kind of like decompressed, it was kind of like, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. And that's what you need to do in a sale. What you, sometimes that, the customer, they're not telling you something and you ask that question and it's kind of like, well, you know, now that you ask where my concerns are, I'm going to tell you why we're concerned and we might not buy from you. Or now that you ask, I am ready to go to the next step. And she said, well, you know, in fact, it's funny you should ask that because my oldest daughter has been saying, Mom, when are you going to start seeing somebody? Kind of thing. And, you know, I think the kids are ready. So, you know, next weekend I have the kids. Why don't you come over and join us Saturday night for dinner? 
And this, she had just what they call in sales, tactical selling skills. She had just advanced. Write that word down. In advance is when the customer, the prospect, the client, contributes to the next steps. So you're finishing a meeting with a client, and in the natural, you don't have to wait until the end and say, okay, I need you to do something. The natural course of that meeting could be that the client is saying, great, Jack, you do, we're, we're going, can you come in next Wednesday? We have our market research team will be in that day, and I'd like to sit you down with them and, and our manager of. Yeah, Wednesday. Okay. The customer has just advanced. So as these things pop up, take, take note of them and come back to them at the end of the meeting. Or at the end of the meeting, you've basically agreed to do two things. Fantastic, you've just inherited four hours worth of work on a lead, on a prospect. No guarantee of a deal. But you're going to go back to your office and invest four hours of your time. You're making an investment. And the client is saying, yeah, send it to me. Okay. It'll be in their inbox. whoop de doo Wow, aren't you good? You're going to have something in their inbox. Measurable. So you go back to the office and they go, yeah, he asked me to send him a document. If I'm your sales manager, I go, and what did they agree to do? Nothing, nothing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on a document. Yeah, what are they gonna do? Well, he asked me for it. What are they going to do? He asked you for it. Hitch, the love doctor, said to Albert, of course she lied to you. She's a nice person. She doesn't wanna tell you no. Customers lie. You lie. You're in that electronic store and you don't like the lights, you don't like the prices, you don't like the staff, and as you're walking out, they come up to you and you go, are you open on Monday? Yeah, I'll be back. And you know you're not coming back. So you're a liar. Okay, sorry. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get, as a salesperson, customers walk you to the lift and they go, Jack, good meeting. Yeah, send it to me. Ah, and you go home saying, he went, ah. if I'm your sales manager, I say, it ah, doesn't mean anything. Send it to my inbox, doesn't mean anything. What are they doing? Well, he said he might look at it. <laughs> yeah, great. Four hours work for that, trip across town, spending all the time, dumping them a little bit of information that they may, okay, what are they doing? So you have the right to say, Phil, delighted to do that. If I send it to you by Friday, can we have a phone call next week? I'll be traveling. How about the week after? Lots of meetings. When can we have a phone call, Phil? I'll come to your office. Don't know, Jack. Phil, you're asking me to do a lot of work there. I'm happy to do it. But you know, what, what do you, what, how do I know that you're really interested in this? And you go, well, that's a little pushy. I have been giving workshops with people, with expert people who have been in the, really making it rain for the company for 10 years alongside of somebody who was a project specialist who got pulled into sales in their six months on the sale. And they go, I could never ask a client that question. And the person who's been making it rain for 10 years says, you've got, thank you, you've got to ask that question. You've got to ask that question. You owe it to yourself and your time management. You owe it to the efficiency of this company not to waste your time with clients who are wasting yours. Okay. And so it's a measurement tool. The advance is a measurement tool. This deal's going well. They've offered to put me in touch with their, with their market research firm. The CEO is in the same day and he wants to give me a quick little introduction. They are putting skin in the game. Skin in the game is an American football term. So when we uh, play hard, we leave our skin on the ground. We have invested, we have sweat, we have put skin in the game. And that's what you want clients to do. Put skin in the game. When it's an emotional tool too. When you make little commitments along the way, and then you say, no, I'm out, that's a bigger decision than to say, yeah, send it to me. Maybe I'll look at it. You open on Monday? No big commitment. You get halfway through that sale, you get halfway, little commitment, little commitment, you got your husband, your wife, your, your, your parents, whatever, into this commitment and all of a sudden you say, no, nah, I don't want to do it. That's a bigger decision for you to step away from the investments you've already made even if you haven't put money on the table yet. That's what you want your clients to do. 
So it's a tactical tool. This is going well. Spend time on client B. Client A is wasting my time. They're not advancing. Client B is giving me all sorts of advances. I'm going to spend more time on them. And it's a psychological tool. Pull them through. Get them making little bit investments. They're trusting you, and they're trusting themselves. It's harder for them to pull away. But then put skin in the game. By the way, my friend, uh, the dinner went really well. After she put the kids to bed, they were snuggling on the couch, saying, well, that went well, really good. And she says, uh, you know, next weekend I don't have the kids. Why don't we drive out to the country and visit my parents? She just advanced again. Things were going. They're living together, by the way. So closing is easy if everything else has gone well. Right? If everything else has gone well, closing is easy. I can give you all sorts of anecdotes where closing is the easiest, you know the easiest question to ask? It's not, do you want it in yellow or blue? Manipulative. Uh, I'm not sure I want it yet. The easiest question is when you're at that point and you just look. And very often they'll go, Jack, I suppose you'll send me an agreement. How should we proceed? If the but you stop and you listen and just let them make the move, okay? Or you say, Tina, things seem pretty clear to me. I want, I want to hear it from you. How do you think we should proceed? I suppose you'll send me an agreement? Or, no, no, wait a minute, I have a few more things to cover. Fine, but you know. If you don't ask, you don't know where you are. Hitch. The Love Doctor. Anyone see the movie, Hitch the Love Doctor? He says to Albert, he, he, Albert says, uh, yeah, so when I asked her to kiss me, he said, what? You don't ask a woman to kiss her. You just kiss her. And Albert said, is it that easy? And he said, well, no, it's not that easy. He said, move 90% of the way and let her move the last 10%. She wants power in the decision too. You go and you just kiss her, Okay? She's going to say, hey, 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 well, even if she wanted it, she may say, move 90% of the way. Tina, how do you think we should proceed? It leaves the decision. They don't want, do you want green or yellow? That's just like jumping on them and kissing them. Okay? How would you like to proceed? Let them answer the question and decide to buy or decide to object. And rate, or to say, well, I've got a few more concerns. Fine. Answer those questions. Bring them 90% of the way and then stay quiet or ask. In fact, Tina, after we did the deal, she kissed me. It was in reception and it wasn't on the lips. <laughs> so, the best salespeople are loved by their clients. They do all of the things that customers trust them. They're not pushy. They listen a lot, they ask great questions, they negotiate in win-win. When they get objections, they don't say, I took the trash out for the last month and you want me to take the trash out again? They go, oh honey, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you know, I gotta get this document done. Can you take out the trash this time? I, okay. They listen and I understand why you said that. When you, the ways to handle They do all the things right to keep the client emotionally in love. I got lots of uh, stories about people who handle objections incorrectly. So the best salespeople fall in love with their clients, but they do the sexual act. They do the sales act well. It's not about I'm a people person. It's, yeah, I'm a people person or not. Introverts make good salespeople, by the way. They listen. It's about doing all of the things to get them to fall in love with you. A sale is love. Love. Poets have written about it. Storytellers have written about it. Songwriters have written about it. Painters paint about it. It is the timeless and universal of, condition, of, of the human condition. The more we give, the more we get. It's like that in a relationship, and it's like that in sales. Love more, sell more. Because love conquers all. Love always wins. So with that, I give it back to Selena. Thank you.